we're going to talk about uh, discriminative and generative learning. For most of the semester, and actually for it turns out because of time constraints for the entirety of the semester, we're looking at the following setting. There's a fixed, possibly unknown distribution uh, D over the uh, uh, the examples, uh, and we have some uh, uh, sorry over uh, the data and also the functions, and we don't know what data uh, is going to show up. We don't know what X hypothesis, what uh, true concept is going to show up. We have instances X, and we have labels Y, and uh, the, like I have written a this the thing I've written here is slightly different from what we've seen before. Uh, we assumed a fixed and unknown distribution over examples and a fixed concepts. Instead, I said we can assume that uh, there's a fixed unknown distribution over the concepts themselves. I'll let it leave it as an exercise for you to think about whether these two things are different. We're given a data set. This data set uh, consists of said x i y i, and uh, the goal of learning is to identify a hypothesis, um, define a log function, or if you're uh, as we saw, define um, so this sort of a likelihood term. You can minimize the average loss over the training data or maximize the likelihood over the training data. You might throw in regularization, you might throw in a prior. One way or another, uh, the guarantee typically takes the form of if we have a hypothesis, we find a hypothesis that minimizes the loss over the observed data, uh, then the the ideas that we encountered in learning theory and such things guarantee that uh, the future behavior of this model will be good. All of this turns out falls under this uh, this style of modeling falls under the umbrella of something called discriminative model. A discriminative model is a model that takes an input and makes a prediction. Uh, we look at uh, a whole bunch of positive and negative examples, and we discover regularities in the data, but more importantly, use those regularities to construct a prediction policy, the rule that labels new examples. Any assumptions that we make here come in the form of assumptions about the hypothesis class. Once again, these are functions that map X to Y. One way or another, the, if, we are, if our goal is to approximate uh, the uh, functions of the form um, that map x to y, we are estimating the conditional probability p of y given x. For a new example that comes in, we are asking what's the probability that y is the right label. So, discriminative models are models that try to estimate the probability of y given x. This is another way of uh, uh, we, you know, there are a few different ways of writing this, but for, for the purposes of this lecture, uh, let's just say that any model that estimates the probability of y given x is a discriminative model. It constructs this policy of what's the label given a new example. Seems like this is all that we've done, right? In direct contrast to these types of models, there's another type of model which we haven't covered at all in the semester. That's called a generative model. The generative model, uh, rather than modeling p of y given x, models the joint probability of y and x. Okay, so rather than saying how to how do you produce the label y for a new example x, the generative model just says what's the probability that this pair x comma y can exist in the universe. That's another you know you can model that also. Any model that does this, any model that models what's called the joint probability distribution of the data is called a generative model. Typically, modeling P of this process, this is exactly the same as P of, of Y times P of X given Y. You can, what I've written on top is a tautology. It's always true. It, by definition, that's true. So typically, generative models set up the learning problem as learning two different probability distribution. P of Y separately, what's the probability that the label can be Y? And a separate modeling problem of what's the probability that if the label was Y, this particular example would be generated. So it's like a generative story. 
So the way to, one way to think about it is, let's say that I have to uh, uh, construct a model for news articles and the section in the, in the newspaper that they show up. Y is which section in the newspaper does this article show up? And X is the actual text of the article. The generative model would say, I'm trying to assign and construct a joint probability distribution of both these things. And the way to do that is first, you sample the section from P of Y. You decide you have 10 sections in the newspaper, you pick a section. So that's simply the distribution over P of Y. And let's say the section that you're interested in today is sports. P of X given Y is now that you need you, you need you have your you need to write an article for the sports section. What are the words that would show up in a sports article, as opposed to what are the words that would show up in an entertainment article? So X given Y is given that the label is sports. What's the probability of seeing that particular image? Uh, we because of uh, time constraints, uh, I've decided to cut this uh, lecture on naive Bayes. Uh, naive Bayes is a the is like a proto is like a standard example of a generative model. Uh, once you have p of y given x, once you have these two expressions, I can always construct p of y given x, the label for a new example using Bayes rule. So p of y given x is simply p of y times p of x given y p of x. I can construct so I have. If I have this expression and this expression, I really don't care about the denominator. I can use Bayes rule to predict the label for new example. So if I have a joint probability distribution, I can reconstruct whatever I needed for this thing here. So naive Bayes, as I said, is an example of a generative model. And typically generative models come with something called, um, I like to think of it as a generative story. This is the story of how each example is generated. I'll walk you through that generative story of the naive base classifier. We haven't covered that. It turns out we will not cover it, but it's simple enough that hopefully it uh, makes sense. First, we pick a label. Like I said, you know, you decide which section of the newspaper um, this uh, article should go into. We, we don't have an article yet. We are generating the article. So you first decide the label. Let's say the label is uh, entertainment. The naive base assumption is that every uh, element of the input in the article, every word, is sampled independently from some conditional distribution, independent of all the others. So you use the uh, this particular you you learn this model p of x one x one is a single word. Given the lamp uh, the label, you sample the first feature independent of all the other features. You sample the first word, for example, of the article. Then you sample the second word, independent of what you did before. You sample the third word, independent of what you did before. You keep doing that. You do that d times. You get d features, and that gives you your article. The naive Bayes assumption is this ridiculous model that says that every word in the document is constructed independent of all the other words in the document, given that the label is whatever it might be. Turns out it kind of works surprisingly well. It's a little disappointing about uh, a disappointing fact of nature that. This ridiculous assumption works better than we might hope, but that's where the, there we go. So very briefly, discriminative and generative models. In generative models, we learn the probability of x comma y, whereas in discriminative models, we uh, learn the probability of y given x. And the way to think about what it means to learn the probability of x comma y or y given x is to think about what is the model capacity being used for? All the parameters in the model, what is it being used for? In When we are learning P of X comma Y, namely the, the joint model or the generative model, we are using the parameters of the model to construct examples and also the label. For a discriminative model, on the other hand, the model capacity doesn't care about how examples are constructed because examples are given and we just have to predict the label. So the standard examples for uh, of generative models are naive base and uh, hidden Markov model, which uh, some of you may have encountered in an AI class. Uh, pretty much all the models that we spent some time on in this class are uh, gen are discriminative. We'll talk about logistic regression on Thursday. Uh, a whole bunch of models that are collectively called conditional models um, are uh, 
uh, discriminative, most neural networks are discriminative. Uh, and if you want like a pictorial explanation of what's the difference between these two things, imagine that you have red circles and blue circles and there's a decision boundary separating them. A generative model models both the inputs and the output. It uses the parameters of the model to you know, discover the fact that there are these clusters in the data here. And then there's like this path here and this path here. In addition to that, it also says, it also uses the capacity of the model to discover this line here. So the model, the parameters of the model have to do the work of discovering clusters in the data plus characterizing the decision boundary. In a discriminative model, it doesn't really care about where the data lies. All it cares about is to characterize that separator that, uh, you know, that tells you, is this example a red circle or a blue circle? It doesn't really care about the internal structure of the data point itself because X is always given. So a discriminative model cannot be used to generate new data points. It cannot be, you cannot ask a discriminative model, can you construct a red example that comes from this cluster? Because it doesn't know about the existence of that cluster. On the other hand, a generative model, you can do that. So it, it does more work. As a result, you are asking more out of the model parameters. So anyway, so the, the, this is uh, this is just like a almost like a detour from where we were. We were talking about Bayesian learning. We'll get back to that. But this is like a interesting and important distinction that occasionally comes up, and it's worth knowing about this difference between generative and discriminative models. Uh, it comes up naturally in a probabilistic setting, and that's why it's part of this unit. Questions about any of this? We are at time, so. If you have questions, feel free to ask. If you don't have questions and you want to leave, feel free to leave. And I have office hours also. Um, so if you have questions, we can continue that in office hours. Is there a question? Um, are the generative models are they better at or the same at just finding that boundary? Then when... That's a good question. In general, they tend to be slightly worse because the models have the models are the same size. They have to do extra work, and so they tend to be a little worse. So, if you only care about predictions, don't care about generative generating data, just go with discriminative models. And most of the successes of machine learning that we hear about all the time are typically with discriminative models. All right, I'll, let's stop, and we'll pick up uh, Thursday. If you have questions, come to office us, or we can talk now. <laughs>